So the loss of uh, biodiversity across the world is um, becoming uh, an urgent global environmental problem. Um, it is, you know, the biodiversity crisis refers to problems like um, the loss of habitat, you know, species extinction, and the loss of total biomass uh, across the globe. This, um, this crisis is now truly planetary in scale and is largely contributed by, uh, by human activities. It has also emerged as um, one of the most pressing environmental problems uh, on, the global, uh, on the global agenda um, and demands urgent cooperation from major countries to highlight the urgency. Scientists tell us um, more than 70% of the, of the global land surface has been altered uh, by human activities. Uh, since the 16th century, more than 700 vertebrate species and nearly 600 plant species um, have gone extinct. And there are probably much more um, you know, animals that have disappeared even without our knowledge. Um, and the US and China, uh, as two large countries and two biodiversity rich countries are not immune uh, from this crisis. Uh, in fact, very recently, the US Wildlife and Fish Service uh, has declared um, 23 species in the US extinct. Um, and on the Chinese side, problems like uh, environmental pollution, wildlife trafficking, urbanization, the impact of climate change are all adding pressure um, to our ecosystem and biodiversity. You know, China is actually uh, one of the 17 mega biodiversity countries um, by uh, the definition of the United Nations. The country harbors around 14% uh, of uh, the global vertebrate species and more than 10% of uh, uh, the plant species. So we're, we are a biodiversity rich country. Um, and in recent years, uh, I think there has been increasing realization uh, on the importance of uh, environmental protection in general, but also uh, biodiversity protection in particular. Uh, this has been reflected in some of the uh, high level political rhetorics and you know, concepts that people you know, hear about such as ecological civilization, uh, but it has also been coupled and complemented um, by concrete policy measures. The establishment, for example, uh, of um, national parks and protected areas across the country in recent years uh, the tightening of our, our wildlife management system, and also the general improvement of environmental conditions here. The air pollution or air quality improvement being one of the um, most prominent uh, uh, case in point. Uh, that said, you know, I, th I think the road ahead of us is still going to be quite long. Um, taking the, um, our recent wildlife management reform, for example, um, this reform was very much triggered by the outbreak uh, of the COVID uh, crisis. Uh, and as a result of that, um, our wildlife management law was a mandate late last year. It has made some progress uh, in tightening management uh, on wildlife as a source of food, uh, but still left important loopholes when it comes to uh, you know, wildlife as a source of uh, uh, medicine, fur, skin, or for the, you know, for the purpose of, uh, of display. So there's still much um, you know, that China can and should do to improve uh, the, um, you know, the biodiversity and species protection. Well, so China will soon be hosting uh, uh, a major conference for uh, the Convention on, Bio on Biological Diversity, the CBD. Um, and this, this uh, conference, COP15, uh, will be a major milestone uh, for, the, uh, for the CBD uh, negotiation process. Um, this meeting carries the task uh, of outlining uh, a new decadal Global uh, Biodiversity Protection Plan. Uh, the Convention on Biological Diversity is a weaker environmental convention compared, for example, to the uh, UN Framework Convention on Climate Change, the UNFCC. Um, it has long suffered from a lack of implementation uh, and also resource um, that uh, developed countries should provide to developing countries. 
And this lack of implementation and resource is precisely uh, why uh, the, the so-called Aichi biodiversity targets, which country uh, produced uh, in 2010, uh, have failed. And precisely uh, where uh, Kunming should do better. Because without implementation and, uh, and, and finance, you know, CBD would risk uh, becoming just an exercise of constantly outlining where we need to be, but without actually answering how do we actually get there. Um, so China, um, this year and next year, will have the task of, you know, steering uh, the global community towards a strong deal. Uh, I think it will be a major test to China's um, environmental diplomacy. Um, so far, Beijing has demonstrated uh, that it is able to help um, you know, and support global environmental governance through its domestic action. Uh, but I think it remains to be seen uh, whether and how it could also provide support in steering um, the, um, you know, the countries towards uh, you know, a, a strong uh, environmental ambition. Uh, and in my view, the biggest legacy that China can leave uh, for uh, the CBD and COP15 is not only about outlining a future global biodiversity vision, but actively ensure that this vision is you know, uh, fulfilled and enforced. I think policymakers uh, in these two countries uh, should at least realize two things. First, the engagement between these two countries in the field of uh, environmental protection and conservation um, is very important. Engagement has worked in the past, and I think it will continue to surface in this particular area uh, in the future. Um, you know, over the past decades, we have seen um, that policy dialogues, for example, uh, between the US and China. Uh, brought some of the pressing environmental challenges to the fore. Um, one example here would be um, the illegal uh, fishing conducted by uh, Chinese overseas, overseas fleets. Um, there, there have been a lot of uh, policy dialogues between the US and China. Uh, and I think US engagement in this area helped you know, brought policy attention uh, to this issue. Um, information sharing and capacity building uh, from the U.S. side uh, also help inspire um, their Chinese counterparts uh, in kind of policy innovation. Uh, one example here would be the establishment of uh, our uh, national park system, which is very much modeled and innovated further uh, based on uh, U.S. Uh, practices. Um, and I think the second point that is important is that both the US and China should continue to explore uh, global environmental governance issues where they can work towards the same direction. Um, and here, climate change, the climate issue uh, has been dominating the headline. Um, but if we uh, recall what happened in the past, US-China collaboration uh, also helped in the past um, to, to unlock major deals uh, related to ocean protection. Um, and um, what uh, some of the recent Chinese announcements um, suggest to me, and including the carbon neutrality announcement made last year, China's decision to uh, ratify the Kigali Amendment to the Control Protocol, and very recently, uh, the overseas coal moratorium. I think you know, what this, this announcement suggests to me is that uh, the US still has a very important role in shaping how China approaches some of the uh, international environmental issues. And there is still political willingness on the Chinese side to make concrete near-term progress. So if the US and China were to extend um, their, you know, the, the current political energy that they are rightly investing in climate change to issues such as biodiversity, conservation, ocean protection. I can indeed see, um, you know, quite a number of areas where they can make concrete progress, which will, of course, bring environmental benefits 
not only to these two countries, but also the rest of the world.